In the 1980s, as I recall, Private Eye would unfailingly refer to the Sunday Times editor, Harold Evans, as small but perfectly formed. The same phrase could be used to describe the, the oeuvre, the output of Laura Wade. Since 2005, there have been only five wholly original plays. Uh, it was Colton Here and Breathing Corpses, both in 2005. Other Hands followed the following year. Posh came in 2010. And then there was a, a very big gap uh, between uh, Posh in 2010 and Home I'm Darling in 2018. Now, of course, that's a little misleading. There have been adaptations of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland as Alice uh, tipping the velvet, uh, and most recently, uh, a radical theatrical transposition of Jane Austen's unfinished short story, The Watsons. Um, there's also a ferociously smart performance piece, Kreutzer versus Kreutzer, uh, which fuses together Beethoven, Tolstoy, and Janacek to tell a riddling tale of, of doubt and infidelity. In 2006, she contributed to the collaboratively written play Catch, upstairs at the Royal Court. She's written several radio plays. She's turned her play Posh into a movie, The Riot Club, in 2014. Three of her plays she's shepherded into the West End, so she's hardly been slacking. Nonetheless, each play seems to emerge from a long period of careful nurturing. To me, this is manifested in the plays in a number of ways. First, in the extremely elegant structural craft of all the plays. They are not just small, uh, the oeuvre is not just small, but it is, as I say, perfectly formed. Posh was inspired by the antics of the, the infamous Bullingdon Club, an all-male dialing club at Oxford University, exclusively, it seems, for the very wealthy, most famous for booking private rooms at restaurants, drunkenly smashing the place up the end, and then presenting the owner with a check for the damage. Former members include two of the last three prime ministers, two of the last three foreign secretaries, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer for most of the 2010s. Apart from the two scenes that bookend the play, it takes us through the arrival at the restaurant, the meal, and the final orgy of destruction. And this is, in some ways, a very static premise for a play, at least until the end. But it's a sign of Wade's remarkable craft that the play unfurls seemingly seamlessly and, and, and grippingly. Breathing Corpses is entirely different. It's an urban thriller in five scenes featuring uh, murders, uh, guilt, taboo desires. But the mystery is enhanced by the chronological disorder of the scenes, leaving us to piece together the story with each scene altering our understanding of the last. Quite different again is the deeply sorrowful, painful play about grief and its anticipation, colder than here, whose delicacy and grace make the play seem in performance, I found, ethereal, though close examination will show it has deep and secure architectural foundations. The second thing I think is evidence of this slow gestation is the distinctiveness of each play. The exuberant class warfare of Posh is a world away from the deep emotional tremors of, of colder than here. The alarming satire of deranged hashtag trad wife gender ultra conservatism, home I'm darling, has a brittle artificiality that is entirely missing from breathing corpses. And this to me suggests uh, a deep commitment to each play as its own thing that doesn't rely on an ongoing set of authorial ticks and well-tried stylistic formulas. Wade reinvents her writing whenever she writes. Third, although I've described her work as elegant, structural, um, I think I even said architectural, I wouldn't want to suggest that her work is cold or over formal academicist uh, in any way. What I'm always struck by is her acute awareness of how being rigorous about form is a way of releasing the deepest emotions, as in colder than here, or uh, to really emphasize the, the, the power of shocking violence, as in posh. And then there's also the kind of wickedly satirical comedy of Home, I'm Darling, and so on. The recent play, The Watsons, the plotting is precisely about creating a structure 
out of which emerges turbulence and wildness and anarchy. It's a play that starts with a pitch perfect uh, pastiche of, of Austen's, Jane Austen's world and ends in a contemporary world of playful absurdity. The play seeming to be, though not actually being, out of the author's uh, control. Fourth and finally, the formal precision of the plays is never an end in itself. Her work shows an ongoing interest, usually I think in middle class life, which she observes with a sometimes affectionate, but sometimes enraged gaze. The corrosive effects of money run through lots of the plays. It's there in other hands, it's there in posh, home I'm darling, and even the Watsons. That last play, the Watsons, uh, opened at the Minerva Theatre in Chichester in, in 2018. It transferred to the Mini Chocolate Factory uh, last year and is due to open in the West End this summer. But just before I recorded this introduction, I saw a tweet from the play's director and lawyer's partner, Sam West, suggesting that this transfer may be postponed or even cancelled. That would be a great shame because it's one of the most exuberant, intelligent and wonderfully silly plays uh, that I've seen for a long time. I, I really think it should have a wider audience. Anyway, uh, Laura Wade is a truly exciting writer and I can't wait to talk to her about her work. Hi. Hello. How are hey. you? All right, thanks. How are you? Yes. Yeah, not bad. You know, just the the madness. How is yeah. lockdown with you? Uh, it, it's it's uh, it's all right. I mean, we we have a garden, yeah. which I feel like I have to sort of fess up to straight away yeah, I mean. <laughs> because. Um, you know that that makes it much easier really that there's like, just just somewhere for the children to go you know just makes it makes a huge difference yes of course so you've got and you've got two young daughters is that right yeah wow okay yeah five um well nearly six and two and a half right um yeah and in terms of, obviously a lot of the playwrights that i've been talking to have had projects curtailed or postponed mm. or deferred or whatever. Did I see yesterday that the Watsons has been postponed and it's, oh, sorry to hear about yeah. that. Is it, yeah, is, no, it thank you. is it off or is it postponed? It's, it's, it's well, it's cancelled for now in that, um, that, it, that it's impossible for them to sort of keep that slot with, you know, it was going to run through till September. Right, of course, yeah. Um, and it's just so unlikely that anything could happen in that in that slot right um so they want uh, they want to try and get it up somewhere next year it might because it's west end obviously it might not then be the same theater yeah um but hopefully we can find somewhere for it and and um engage when when it's the right time yeah yeah um so but yeah, it's, it's tricky because you know that was that was, um, you know, a cast of sixteen people expecting to be yeah, I know. busy the whole summer, and Gosh, that's, that's awful. You know, yeah, and they're and they're the most they're the most beautiful group of people, and I'm 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 sad that I'm not going to get to see them next week. But yeah, oh well, I'm so I sorry about that. Cool. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Obviously, we're going to be. Uh, talking about the Watsons, which I'm sure will more than make up for a, a West End <laughs> run. Um, a brother not to cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, of course, it's an adaptation in, in part and of a certain sort. Uh, but you, yeah. you've also, in the past, you, you've adapted Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, quite a strong uh, adaptation. And also Sarah Waters' Tipping the Velvet. Um, how would you compare adaptation to wholly original writing? I think it's, I like doing it because it feels like a different bit of my brain being used because the, somehow the, 
the task is is how to tell the story rather than what the story is it kind of liberates me from having to work out what on earth happens at the end sort of thing or in the middle or you know there's always some bit that you're not sure about but um and so it free i find it very freeing theatrically in, in in terms of just being able to really think about what the theatrical form of the story is and i've always been um i've always really cared about that that if 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 you're going to adapt something for the theatre that it's it needs to have a quite strong theatrical identity mm -hmm. in order to um to um justify its it, it being a play rather than just it being a familiar title or a you know a, a set of characters that people love and want to see again but but that the the theatrical idiom has to bring something new to the story or the story mm -hmm. has to sort of sit quite strongly uh, in inside that um and you know with something like tipping the velvet that was that was a, i mean literally theatrical because we um use the kind of the, the victorian music hall thing yeah. To, yeah. to tell the whole story which in the book is only kind of part part of the sort of the first third of it but we sort of pulled it all the way through yeah um and um yeah so i love working out what what sort of theatrical playfulness can be thrown at something in order to, to sort of tell it in in the course of an evening yeah which is obviously quite, quite a different task as well from a, an, an entire book that people are going to pick up and put down um, I, was, I, I i sometimes think doing adaptations that you get a, a very sharp sense or it really focuses your sense of what what a, a kind of dramatic theatrical narrative is like compared to a novel yeah. narrative because yeah. yeah. in, in some ways they seem very similar you meet lots of characters things happen and then yeah. there's an ending but actually they, yeah. they really function differently really not and i found with with the with doing the adaptations you have to choose quite a clear line through the book yeah very quite consciously mm. um that quite um and and i love the architecture actually of putting a, a play together which i think is probably why i, I enjoy doing adaptations is you, you you choose the structure that you're going to do and then quite quickly quite a lot of the book then falls away because it becomes irrelevant to that thing mm -hmm. so it is a very selective thing so it's it's absolutely your take on that book um and yeah. um you know if in, if you're doing something i've only done one thing with the living writer which was tipping the velvet and sarah waters really um was was really supportive of our of our doing that of just just going this is the story we're telling doesn't mm. mean we don't like all the other bits but this is what yeah. we've got time to do in one evening yeah right uh, and uh, it's interesting that in the watsons which um uh, if if people didn't see or haven't read the watsons spoiler alert it's jane Austen <laughs> up to a point and then yeah. laura appears in it and starts yeah working with the characters or against the characters and being rebelled against by the characters and so on. Um, but there's a sort of, it, I wondered if there's a deliberate joke in there in that the way you put yourself in there is casting yourself as the humble servant, which of course is a sort of traditional view of the adapter, you know, that you are humbly serving the text. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that doesn't feel like that is your, relationship it's certainly not your relationship <laughs> to the Watsons yeah I mainly sort of cast myself as the bumbling idiot but um, <laughs> sort of, um yeah I mean it needed to be I started the adaptation um in in knowing that I wanted to do something quite playful with it and the fact of it being unfinished of course you know that was that was sort of built in that it I didn't want to do a sort of straight finishing but yes in order to make the narrative work the Laura in the play kind of needed to want to do a straight finishing in order that the characters could turn around and say no hang on a minute we don't want that that's boring yeah um so yeah so that was a that I hadn't I hadn't really thought of it like that before Dan but yeah that's kind of a, yeah <laughs> um uh, there's also there's a, a moment I love in it 
it because it it's the it raises the question why bother adapt novels mm. for the stage because mm. the novels there just read the novel christ sake why do you need a, a play and there's a bit where well, one of the characters kind of says to you, but why why not write a novel? Why write a play? And you're the Laura in the play kind of says rather sheepishly, I like it when they clap. Um, and uh, how far is that Laura in inverted commas in the play? And how far is that your preference? Oh, that's absolutely me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I like, um, it's not, it's not just, it's not just the clapping and the sort of slap on the backness, but the, the kind of, um, just the feedback, I think, um, the being in the, in the room with the audience when they're laughing and getting it, yeah. or, um, just, you know, the thing that we all say, and the, you know, the thing that we're all really missing right now, of course, in lockdown is that liveness. Mm. Um, and I think that's the thing that I've always found most exciting about writing for theatre. Yeah. But I, yeah, I, I can't, yeah, the, the clapping is, is um, essential, I think. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, well, I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't want to have a, a room full of people say, I enjoyed that? Yeah. No, I you know, and I always think that the thing with 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 novelists and who who I admire enormously. I mean, books have so many words in, so many more words than a play, um, and they take forever, and and that you don't even know if anybody's going to buy it. Um, but I I sort of I'm sad that they don't get to be there mm. and and enjoy the person enjoying their book kind of thing. I mean, yeah. you couldn't sit there and watch someone read your whole book, could you? That would be really um, freakish. Um, <laughs> and maybe they sort of occasionally see someone on the tube re reading yeah. their book and go, oh, that's my book. But yeah, yeah it's, it's just that, that, that you do, you write to communicate. Yeah. And obviously theatre is, is quite a pure form of that because like, it's, it's, it's immediate. But that thing that, you know, that as a writer, when you're in an audience of your own play, particularly kind of in mm. preview, when you're, you're really finding out what, how an audience is going to respond to it, you have those moments of where you yeah. go, why didn't you laugh at that? And why are you laughing at that? You know, those mm. sorts of things. Yeah. You can imagine a novelist, yeah. if, if a novelist did actually watch someone reading, they, there'd be a moment where they kind of go, why are you putting the book down? Why are you going off and making a cup of tea there? They'd have this, the same <laughs> sort of things that actually we think about all the time. You know, kind of, the next yeah. chapter's the best. Don't stop now. Yes. Um, yes. Anyway, um, yes. <laughs> moving on to kind of original plays. Um, I'm kind of very mm. struck, like actually quite a few of the writers that I've been talking to, your plays are all quite different I think I don't feel like I mean I think there are certain persistent kind of concerns and there's a sort of playfulness and so on but but there, it's not I don't feel like there's a sort of Laura Wade signature in the way that there's a pinter kind of style do you know what I mean it feels like there's a conscious yeah. attempt to reinvent for each play is that is that fair or do you see much more continuity I suppose that I, I see some continuity continuity in sort of micro things, hmm. which are, which are probably kind of about my character. Um, you know, most of my plays at some point that <laughs> there'll be a character, for example, who is a language pedant of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> that, that crops up quite a lot of people. People. <laughs> um, uh, uh, correcting each other's spelling or use of idiom or, or, or whatever. And uh, so, um, but in terms of kind of larger themes and, and in terms of, and I, I, there, you know, there are occasional um, characters speaking that I think I sometimes notice and go, that, that sounds a bit like me rather than necessarily being kind of germane to that person. Um, mm. But but yeah, I think it, it's it's always each 
each story or each world sort of requires something different in the telling of it. Also, I take so long to go from one to the other that I've I've kind of probably changed a bit right. in between as well. I mean, I've got I'm getting slower and slower. Right. Um, which are the you know the, these days is obviously necess necessarily to do with having a family and, and you know other things going on, but. Um, you know, Home I'm Darling was written kind of, you know, six years after Posh. Right. And that's, that's a lot of, of time and a lot of different kind of influences and, and, a, and a slightly different world, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, would you say that your plays tend to start from a similar place, i.e., do you generally kind of go, it's when you, you get a story idea or is it there's an image or an issue or a formal device or something? What, what would you say? I think it tends, uh, um, it tends to be a sort of something quite clear and metaphorical, uh, 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 as in the theatrical metaphor or something. For example, um, with Posh, and I, I, which I started originally, um, Lindsay Turner and I were working together as a, 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 doing a kind of general research into the idea of young wealthy people mm. in Chelsea and, um, you know, find, trying to, f looking for a story with that. And I, I was kind of off and running at the point where we learned about the dining societies and I kind of hooked on the idea of that's, um, the idea of a group of people having a meal and then smashing the restaurant up afterwards and believing because of their wealth and their position that they can pay their way out of it at the end felt like a really simple and useful shape and um, metaphor for for the things that I wanted to talk about in the play so then once it's got once it's got that kind of skeletal form then I feel like I know I can start filling in the gaps. So that's the point at which it starts to feel safe. And sometimes I start working on something that feels really like a really good idea. I've had one, I've had this happen quite recently with something that felt like a really good idea. And I just, I sort of tried to start before I, before I got that mm. and it, and I've, and I've killed it. Uh, that's because I can't, I haven't found, or maybe it will come back, maybe I'll find it, but sure. uh, you know, with, with Home I'm Darling, it was, there were a lot of swirling ideas about um, sort of contemporary feminism really, um, and um, domesticity, and um, the way that everybody was suddenly sort of felt like they were nesting at the time when I began the, the play, and um, but it was it was the sort of the vintage idea and that okay what's well, about this this vintage person living in a house and that was kind of again that that was enough of a framework for it that it had a place and it had um it had a character and then then, then i was able to fill it in from there and so just just kind of picking that apart just a little bit what's interesting yeah. is that you you kind of said that you you will you might start with a set of concerns, but then mm -hmm. you said there's there's a sort of formal moment, and the phrase you mm -hmm. use that's when it starts to feel safe, which I think is a really interesting mm -hmm. way of describing mm -hmm. it. So there's a kind of so would you say that actually sometimes you're thinking, or domesticity or wealth or something, mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. kind of go and you think I'm interested in that as a person. Mm -hmm. But it's only mm. when you kind of go, oh, and we could do it like this on stage that you start to think the play has started. Is yeah, is I think so. It starts to feel thick or or rich. I suppose it's you know it, it rather than something that's just a sort of air, really. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. It starts to feel real. It starts to feel like a thing that people could sit down and watch. And that's still a long way from it, from there being kind of enough pages of words for anybody to sit down and watch or even sit around a table and read. Um, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a feeling. It is, it's a feeling. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of tummy feeling of, um, of just kind of knowing what to do. Yeah, right. 
that you have a shape to go forward with. Yeah, yeah, just, just have to begin, just have to be, and that shape might not survive. Yeah, right. But it's something to start from. Right. Um, huh. Yeah. Uh, rather than a sort of, um, you know, it's like, it's like if you tried, if you suddenly, if you were thinking, I would really want to write a play about the NHS. Yeah. You can't write a play about the whole NHS. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or, or if you could, if you did, it would be some kind of like terrible, um, sprawling kind of Olivier Theatre epic, lots of people running off and on with trolleys kind of thing. And, it, you know, it, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have its a, a strong shape. Whereas at the point where you go, okay, it's about the consultant who's just discovered the new cure for cancer but he can't get the funding because um yeah. you know yeah exactly um yeah and uh i mean you said that you're you're taking longer and longer to write plays um the the process i mean let's say you have your kind of formal idea mm. or at least you have a, a shape of some kind that's going to hold mm -hmm subsequent ideas for a while um mm. what are you actually are you at that point starting to try out dialogue or are you still accumulating plot ideas character ideas research images um do you yeah so in other words do you build up to a point where you start writing or are you actually kind of writing the whole way through the process I, uh, well, things, things will start coming out like snippets of things yeah. and, we'll, and we'll go down in a notebook at, as I'm doing researchy bits. So the most useful bits of research are the bits that suggest story, of course. Yeah. Um, and my attitude with research, which I don't think I'm particularly good at doing, um, it takes me ages. I've never managed to sort of acquire that ability to, to gut a book really quickly, for example. Um, uh, but um i've completely lost where i was going um research, yeah how you use research to yeah yes so i tend so i tend to do um kind of just enough to get me to a point where i feel like i, I can then make things up yeah so it's it's having a sort of bedrock of knowledge about the subject hmm. um which is way way below expertise but it's um there's a, a sort of feeling that one could, if one did too much, you'd get to a point where you felt kind of beholden to the research rather than a kind of um, theatrical truth, I suppose. Yes. There's that very useful, I think, Stephen Jeffries line where he says, you know, when you, I think he says, when you do research, take a very small briefcase. In other words, you don't want to do I mean, bless him, but you don't want to do a stop hard where you go, okay. I've done this amount of research and it's all going in the play. Not that stop hard does that. <laughs> may, may I just say that? But you know, you don't want to put all the research on the yeah. stage. You just no, kind of. No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I wouldn't have the ability to hold that much in my head either, I don't think. Right. Um, but it's basically, yeah. And it's it's quite willfully kind of taking what's useful and leaving what isn't yeah right absolutely um, and yeah uh, so do you um is that i mean you say the the, the process is lengthening but would that sort of would, would that typically be an quite an intense period of development in your head or will you actually sit with a play idea for you know years i don't know I think I, the the idea it, it it sort of snowballs as it goes on, right? Usually, um, and there'll be a bit where it's it's sort of noodling around in the back of my head. Like I've got a new idea at the moment, and I'm, I've just got a sort of um, a file open in Word, which is probably only about sort of five pages long so far. But I'm just sort of jotting bits in as, they, as I think of them so it's just a sort of bucket really to sort of drip things into yeah. um, and I suppose to continue that analogy at some point the bucket is full enough to well, kind of wash your hands in I don't know <laughs> um, but that um, there comes a point where there's enough there for me to sit down and say this is my by which point I've probably kind of attempted to sell the idea to somebody or you know or I've decided you know which of various 
permissions it's going to be for sort of thing right um and um and then and then there's a long quite a long period of uh, still of planning and structuring and kind of working out who the characters are and what they're up to and um and, and making quite a strong really quite strong and detailed plan before i start actually sitting down um and writing the st scenes it right. with it with i suppose with the sort of idea in my head that if i do all of this then the scenes will write themselves and then of course they don't, they don't. um um, and there's still the sort of um, blank page moment, but I do at least have a sense. I've got stuff pinned up. I mean, this this wall behind me is usually covered in post-it notes of whatever I'm doing. Um, I, I've I've got a blueprint for it. Yeah, that's um, interesting because because um, I think I knew that that you're you're definitely a planner um, mm. rather than just sort of hey ho, let's start writing and see where the where the, where, the, where the whim takes me. Um, no. and, and in fact, there's a line in there somewhere, I think in the Watsons, where somebody says, mistakes generally happen at the planning stage, I think, in, in writing no. a play. Is that, is that your experience that actually, if, if you run into huge difficulties in a play, it's probably because the plan was wrong? Well, there's something I haven't thought through. You're right. Or I've kind of, I still do it. I still do it though. I'll, I'll think, oh, that'll solve itself, and yes. it doesn't. Right. Uh, I, for, for me, there's there's no um, substitute for that rigor, really. And I, I really admire writers who can just kind of do the organic, um, sit down and let it all kind of flow. But for me, it doesn't flow. Right. Until I've done the post-it notes. Until I've done yeah. the blueprint. And that's when it, that, that allows it to flow. And probably other people are doing the exact same thing, just a lot faster and inside their heads, <laughs> rather than having to actually, you know, enact it as a sort of stationary fetish. But that, <laughs> I've, kind of I've kind of accepted my, that about myself now. I think that that's how I do it. And when, when you talk about a structure or a plan, um, of course, probably every playwright who does a plan will do a different sort of thing. And, you know, some playwrights, you, you, they say they plan, you look at what they, uh, their document, you go, that's not a plan. How does that help you? Whereas it sounds like you've got something that really is quite kind of meticulous and robust. I mean, yeah. what, would it, what would your wall look like? What would be on it? It would be um, a, a load of small pieces of paper with, if I'm working out when things happen, it's sort of so and so says this to so and so, or so and so comes in and it's and it changes the temperature, or um, this this thing happens, or you know that this this is the interval point that we're heading for, and this is the thing that people are going to um, be talking about in the loo queue kind of thing, or that you know that's what that's yeah, the yeah. structure of that, and then this is the, and then there might be even more. Um, uh larger things about this 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 scene feels like the, this kind of section feels like a slow burn ramping up to something and then this section feels like when it all explodes so so kind of more macro kind of ideas like that um and then eventually it becomes um a, a, a kind of written document that i've kind of typed up and that might even have some sections of dialogue in it yeah. and, and where they where they come and and then if i bits that i don't know about was saying that the, the scene where sh she tells him she loves him and he tells her to fuck off kind of thing um yeah. underneath it um and so and and that that kind of helps track things through as well but that's that can be quite a long document yeah yeah i bet um, and it, yeah, and a thing that I sort of will end up then carrying around with me for a bit, and and um, and adding to and um, scribbling on and and actually sitting with if I'm trying to then go on and write the scene. Hmm. Um, that, that's yeah. that's very interesting. And a couple of things I think that uh, struck me about that is that that what that suggests to me is that when you're imagining the events of the play. Uh, mm. you're imagining things happening on a stage rather than happening, let's say, in a real gastropub 
restaurant. Because if you're if you've got the thought of the loo queue or the interval, yeah, uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, it, it is. It is. I don't think the characters know they're in a play, but I know they are. Mm. Um, except in the Watsons, where they except in the Watsons, they all realise that. Yeah, um, but yeah, and it's um. Although I can still, I can still end up sort of seeing the gastro pub on the stage yes so, you know I, I sometimes i'm imagining the characters talking in a fairly literal space mm. um but yeah it's always within within the framework so i have a sense sitting down that this is a scene that probably n needs to be a certain length and this is the number of things that i have to sort of cleverly make happen during that time yeah right so yeah. it's you know it's quite it's, it's really quite a conscious yeah. process. Um, so the in a way, I sort of, I, well, no, I'm just thinking that in a way that I've occasionally felt um, uh, slightly sheepish about because because it's not because it's not very organic. It's um, but then it doesn't it de equally. It doesn't mean that surprises can't come out of that, and quite often that plan will get thrown out the window, or I'll suddenly have an epiphany and go, "That act two is just nonsense. I should be doing this." Yeah. And then I'll kind of, you know, um, regretfully have to tear up quite a lot of work, but actually know that the thing that's coming later is going to be better. Because there's a really great moment, which is the obverse of of what we've been discussing in the Watsons, where. Um, uh, well, one of the characters kind of said, well, but why are you having to intervene? If you're writing me, you know what I'm going to do. You know, how can I possibly mm. surprise you as an author? And I think you, Laura just says something like, uh, it's complicated to explain. And of yeah. course, I know exactly what that means. You know, that weird way that you go, I'm writing these characters. Yeah. But as um, I remember Robert Holman, I saw Robert Holman, mm talking about uh, playwriting and he said what I do is I start writing at 9 30 every morning and I write until one of the characters says something that surprises me and you go yeah of course and that's we all know what that experience is like where you're kind of going what the hell well I didn't know you had that you know that thought literally was not in my head 15 yeah. seconds ago and now it's basically yeah. saying that uh, and that, of course, is the opposite of the, the planning and the structure and the architecture. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have moments where one is resisting the other? You know, where you're... Do, or how do you stop the architectural bit from inhibiting the, the discovery? Yeah, that's a really good question, because, of course, you, there is the danger, isn't there, of... of um of boxing everybody into a corner and not allowing them to kind of mm. fully spread their wings but I, I suppose that that comes out in the if it doesn't flow when i'm writing it from the blueprint then there's something wrong with the blueprint yeah right yeah um and that you know then that's worth and quite often what i'll i'll attempt at that point is is something kind of more organic in a small way in terms of well let me just I'll, I'll try and write the scene and see where it wants to go mm. um and 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 sort of challenging the the plan as well in terms of what what if it isn't that what if it's the opposite of that actually mm -hmm. um yeah. and you know just kind of just trying to f flip things um and quite often you know something that sounds like a really good idea for a scene when you come to write it just just won't mm. yield somehow right. it's like um and once you've easy. got that once you've got your kind of structural plan mm. would you would you um does that mean that the writing is quite a short intense period where you're just basically kind of doing the paperwork as it were yeah, I mean, usually by then it's quite close to the deadline, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that, stuff, that sort of yeah. lights a fire underneath it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the point, and I like that point. I like getting to that point and sitting down and telling myself I'm going to 
I'm gonna this whole scene written today or I'm gonna get Henry Goodges today or I'm gonna yeah. you know, try and um, get to a point where where it exists as a full play because then that's that's the point where you can actually work out whether it does work or not and yes. what, you know what what needs to happen to it and um uh, this is a really banal uh, question but um pen or computer are you um both uh, but no never pen never oh. pen um pencil these these pencils oh. um they're a clicky clicky kind um, with oh, a, with you were serious double. about stationary fetish. Yeah. <laughs> well, but have you not found this with other writers? Everybody's got a little. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a particular brand of notebook that I use, and I know um, I know when I move an idea from the A5 notebook to 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 its own A4 notebook that that we're going on a journey with that one now. That's becoming a that's going to be a plan. Um, Actually, I think that's quite yeah. specific to you. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure other playwrights have actually said that, which is kind of interesting. I was, I was a PA for a few years before I was a uh, um, professional writer, so maybe it's it's kind of a, a hangover from that. In that the the stationery cupboard was by far the most interesting place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but no, it's always pencil because pen feels like um, you can't, it's too final kind of thing, it's too committed. Um, and um, right, that's interesting. yeah, and which, um, it, most people because they say, Can I borrow a pen? and I have to say, I've only got a pencil in my bag. And they're like, Why? Why? <laughs> um, You're a writer, <laughs> you must have a pen. I know I've got loads of these, um, but yeah, no, I, it, it tends to sort of dialogue quite often comes out of the end of the of the pencil right and then there's a there's there's an edit that happens sort of between that and it getting typed up mm. okay and uh, do you because i think some of your plays uh, clearly make uh, kind of puzzling demands on production so the watsons is a good example because on one level how on earth do you do this? How are you going to stage this thing that, that mm. really cr crashes two fully developed worlds together? Um, posh yeah. to some extent, um, breathing corpses, those sort of questions about how you move those scenes around. How far mm. do you worry about production possibilities when you write or how far do you just go, that's not my problem, that's their problem? I always love the moment when a designer comes on board and sort of tries to solve yeah. all of these ridiculous problems that I've set them. Um, uh, I think, and, and some of the time it just sort of comes out of a naivety about what, what it takes to, to, to do something or to move, to move us from world to world. Um, and the, the best people that I've worked with have sort of made those, made a virtue of those difficulties hmm. there's a bit in in home i'm darling where the second half begins three years before oh uh, yes um our, our action in the first half and the house is subtly different because they haven't done it up yet hmm. so there are some some things that are the same but quite a lot of things are just a bit crapper but it's fairly subtle yeah. um and, and needs to be for that scene and then the very next scene we're back to three years we're back to the present so it needs to sort of go forward three years back to this pristine house um and you know it's it's it, you know it, so they've got time to effect that change in the interval but then no time at all to get back yeah um and Anna Fleischler the designer and uh, Tamara Harvey the director between them came up with this just amazing dance sequence that was actually i mean people it, it got a round of applause <laughs> like the right. scene change yeah. because it was so brilliant what they'd done in terms of um you know a, a picture falls off the wall and and this gets magically pulled through a hole and and, and everything kind of and there was just a, such a joy in it in watching the house change yeah um so i kind of i kind of like now leaving those kind of um, little kind of opportunities 
in scripts for people and I'm, I'm not clever enough to be doing this deliberately as I set out but I quite like that they're there I mean the stage direction of the Watson says the Welsh and um, that I didn't know what that meant really or what that what that would look like um, uh, it, actually just you, because you um you the, there was an interruption i'll just repeat that stage direction because it's it is great uh the world shimmers with possibility as a stage yeah director. um and you're yeah. saying you you wrote that and you thought i don't know what that means but i didn't really know i mean i liked the idea that the world should shimmer with possibility but i'm you know not don't have a visual enough brain to to know what that is and, and ben stones came up with a kind of just a very beautiful very subtle um, little trick in the set that is just sort of sits there waiting the whole play yeah. and then at the end the these walls just kind of crack open and light floods in and yeah. if you were looking at, at your shoes for for 10 seconds you'd miss it but hopefully you're not and and it's just there and then it's black and it goes and it's just it's just utterly gorgeous and I mean for me that those moments like that are, are, are kind of are reasons to be in this really are reasons to be in this nonsensical kind of collaborative um process mm. because when you get those other brilliant people that come in and and just add something that's that's not only beautiful but also really really resonant yeah um and just just adds adds something to what to what you've put on the page mm. um but yeah, but no, but with the earlier stuff, things like breathing corpses, that's just naivety. I just didn't, I, I don't think I was thinking at the time, uh, okay, now we're moving from a hotel room into a room in a storage facility and both of them need to be fairly well realised because my scripts tend to be quite proppy and people keep picking things up and talking about them. Mm. Right. So, um, you know, can I ask, make it easy. For can I ask you about writer's block? uh have you had it how do you <laughs> how do you cope with it how do you get past it um it's it's horrible mm. i mean there's a, there's a there's a bit in um uh in the watsons where the laura character talks about just being in a hole and not knowing what to do and yeah. um, finding herself sort of sat on the kitchen floor and um, not, not, not knowing, just, just simply not knowing where to go next. And for me, I find it quite a panicky feeling and, and quite, um, just, just really quite bleak and difficult and sort of angry as well. And um, it's, it's it's always a sort of a storm that kind of builds up and then dissipates once I've thought of something that solves it. Mm. But it's the time it takes to think of the thing that solves the problem that's that's difficult. Um, and often I find the causes of it will be um, that I've just sort of buried, been too buried in the in the piece without having taken any time f uh, away from it to sort of, I mean, I, I, I feel like creativity is a fire that you have to feed. Yeah. And very often the fuel is um, other people's stories. Mm. Um, I'm more likely to get blocked if I haven't been to the theatre for a month, for example. Or if I haven't had, if I think I haven't had time to go to the theatre, or I haven't had time to watch a film or read a book or anything, because I'm so busy trying to get to this deadline, yeah. um, it's actually um, it's a false economy mm. because I put myself in a place where the, the fire is kind of getting low and hasn't been fed. Um, so very often, just sort of doing something different mm. will will help. You know, I, I think of I think of some of my best ideas when I'm like watching a concert or something that's that's not even a story. Yeah. But just being able to get get kind of um, immersed in someone else's creativity sometimes. Um, yes. and, um, Sorry. 
and also things like going for a walk getting just getting away from it or um occasionally if it's really bad trying to go and like sit in a coffee shop for half an hour with a notebook um, but th but it's there's always quite a lot of crying and hand wringing and um uh yeah it's not it's not a good look <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I'm partly asking that because, uh, as you say, there's that moment in the Watsons, but in some ways, the Watsons sort of feels like a product of that kind of panicky, how on earth do I write this adaptation? Um, is, is, it was, was there any genuine kind of confusion about how on earth am I going to approach adapting the Watsons or it or was the was this sort of meta theatrical slightly Pirandellian thing baked into the original idea um it's it I suppose it was baked in in the sense that I knew that I wanted to do an adaptation where the characters decided um they didn't want to follow the story that had been laid out for them okay at the point where the original author that was my kind of that was my um initial safe idea to go back to what we were saying at the beginning about the point where you know the, sp the springing off point um but but with this one that was that you know okay i don't know if you have this but occasionally there's an idea that sounds really good as a short paragraph <laughs> like the elevator pitch is cracking <laughs> to actually try and make it into a, a whole thing is a, a a marathon torture process yeah. um, because it's just so difficult like it, it's like that sounds amazing yeah it does sound amazing try writing it yeah. um, and um, so yeah this this was one of those really in terms of having you have that idea and then how is it going to work mm. how's it going to work in a in a contained enough way that we can watch it in one go so the, the the version that got performed first at, at Chichester and then at the Chocolate Factory last year um, was an 82 page script but the previous draft to that was 130 something so it was this huge oh. like bloated mess of a thing that um, <laughs> at some point where the characters tied Laura to a chair for a while and then sort of just ran around doing what they wanted and it was just, not so good um, so it, yeah mm. it was a funny one and um, uh, just to uh, make it work and where did where did the project actually start was it your idea to adapt the watsons did somebody bring that project to you or what no it's not i was invited by a producer to do a adaptation of something that could be um and this is it, it was a, it, many many years in the making this one it, um I think I first started work on it in like 2006, something like that. Oh, right. Um, yeah, and um, I mean, it went into the drawer for quite a long time in the middle of that. But um, it was the idea of, of doing an adaptation of something that was well known, so it could be quite commercial. Mm -hmm. And uh, I liked, I sort of found, I, you know, always loved Jane Austen and found this unfinished one and thought that sounded like it could do that thing that I was already thinking about then of having a really strong theatrical identity yeah. um, because what what if these characters what happens to the characters when she goes and there was quite a long period of not knowing what that would be so the Laura character wasn't in it initially uh -huh. which turned out to be to have been um, a huge problem because at the point in the play um, initially when Jane Austen stopped writing, we were sort of supposed to intuit from how everybody was behaving. In fact, I think there was even one draft where I had the set kind of fell down. Okay. Um, and you were supposed to know from that that Jane Austen had left the building and then they would, they would all sort of start doing what they wanted and it was chaotic. Um, and so kind of later on in putting the Laura character in, which I resisted from our, for a while because I thought, what? A kind of an egotist puts themselves in a play um but um but it worked because it gave them an authority figure to kick against and so that was a moment that kind of brought it back to life really right 
Yes. Yeah, for ages it seemed like it was unstageable. It had this huge cast. Nobody was going to want to do it. The or original producer very graciously kind of gave it back to me and said, here you go, <laughs> go take it somewhere else. At which point I just wanted to kill it um, dead and um, and just left, sort of left it for ages. Um, and, and Sam, my partner, who ended up directing it, um, sort of persuaded me to get it because he always sort of loved the idea you know that that paragraph idea that sounds really amazing it could be amazing um persuaded me to sort of get it out eventually after years of um rowing about it and um and by that point um was able to sort of take it apart and put it back together in a in a way that actually built something that would work right that's i, I, I want to ask a bit about that taking it apart and putting it back together thing mm -hmm. it's something about rewriting which it, which i'd like to, to mm. think about but um but actually uh let me confess i've never read the watsons i mean i've read your version i've never read the jane austen uh, watsons um could you could you roughly just describe it and kind of where it ends yeah it ends um it do, it, it doesn't end with, i so i had to go in there and um and, and sort of change the point where it ends for the purposes of the play because it sort of tails off. Right. Um, so we have basically, basically the same, most of the same setup story in that Emma um, arrives in Stanton and she's come back to her family from this rich aunt that she's been living in and she's now in these straitened circumstances of not having any money and one of several daughters in the family and needing to find someone to marry and going to a ball and meeting various potential men um, and uh, meeting the rest of her family and you know her sister-in-law is a bit of a gargoyle and um, her brother's very keen that they get married because he doesn't want to be responsible for the sisters um, financially and the father is very ill and um, looking like he's probably on his last legs and and the the jane austen extract um ends in on a quite a downbeat with emma not knowing what to do um sitting with her father spending more and more time sitting with her sick father in his bedroom um and in a quite depressed place and it felt a bit like jane austen had kind of got in got herself into a bit of a hole at that point right um, so in order to make the play work, because Jane Austen, the notes that Jane Austen left suggest that she was going to have Lord Osborne propose to Emma. Right. Um, so I kind of unpicked it a little way mm -hmm. and then sewed it back up with, with Lord Osborne coming in and the proposal scene and Emma saying yes and that being the moment when Laura has to intervene right okay that's interesting yes that makes a lot of sense because it's a much crunchier moment of the story isn't it for for yeah, the intervention yeah. to happen um yeah, much yeah yeah and uh and so you it's interesting because you've you obviously earlier in the in the discussion you were talking about creating this quite substantial formal structural plan but mm. you've also talked about successive versions of this play having wildly different things happening. So if, because if you're, if you weren't in earlier drafts of this play, that's a completely different structural plan, I would imagine. So, so yeah. how does, how does the, how does that rewriting relate to the structural plan? So I think that that structural plan was probably written re and rewritten several times. Right. Over that. 12 years whatever it was mm -hmm. in, a, in a kind of taking it apart and putting it back together again way several times um and because it, on a on a serious rewrite probably like a second draft of something if 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 it needs some kind of st structural fiddling they would still that would i would still end up doing another big blueprint right okay that's very interesting and working and working from that and does the i mean do you think the having that kind of separable plan does that actually make rewriting easier because 
I can think of a project I did where there was actually a huge change to the story, a complete fundamental shift of the story. But I kind of could look at the plan and go, actually, it means I need to take that bit out, that bit out, and that bit out. But nothing else yeah. really needs to change. Whereas yeah. I think if I'd written it in a more sort of organic way, it would be a bit more like I may just have to start again and, and rewrite it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I always uh, approach a rewrite with a sort of salvage um, objective in my head of like how, how much of what, what the, the previous version, because that took me ages. I don't want to throw it all in the bin. And I, I, was, so I heard some, some, a writer um, starting a new draft and sort of just starting again. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that, seems, that seems a lot of work. <laughs> um, so it's sort of like working out what, what can survive mm -hmm. the previous version, but also needing to, to do that blueprint because, like, if I've decided that the um the george character doesn't exist in this new version then mm. i need to have that written down in, and and have formalized how in all the different ways in which i can solve all the bits that george was in mm. for example yes. and 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 kind of get get him out of there and i suppose very mostly those those documents are just about getting things clear for myself so i don't get confused mm. um and particularly with um with a world now where there are sort of family things going on being able to come back to the desk mm. and know where i've got to yeah right it's okay. really it's really helpful because there isn't there isn't the time now to do that thing of going off down the rabbit hole and staying down there until you've solved it yeah right because if if school pickup time happens before you know that, you, that, that there are things like that that can't be yeah. moved or changed so it's sort of trying to yeah being able to kind of get back to the desk and pick it up the next day and um in in terms of that balance we talked about a bit earlier between the kind of the the, the structured the architectural and the improvisational um mm. Where, for example, was the idea of aliens landing? Spoiler alert, aliens landing at the end of <laughs> the Watsons. We have to assume, don't we, that if anybody's still listening, they're, um, <laughs> yeah. they're not worth the spoilers. Um, that was just, how mad can we go at this point? Right. And sort of, um, I think the play... Um, the play kind of explodes with with possibilities at that point right uh and um it probably came out of me sitting down writing a list of what what mad things what mad things don't happen in jane austen books well you right. don't there are no there are no spaceships at all in jane austen books <laughs> are you sure have you read them all yeah i've, I've read all of them i've read all oh, six of them there isn't, there isn't a single spaceship with mountain ever. disappointment you've <laughs> discovered she just doesn't mention it she doesn't like the napoleonic wars she just doesn't mention it um, but, um yeah, so that felt like a thing to, I just to sort of, I like the idea because you, because you spend so long to sort of creating an internal logic, mm. but sometimes it's nice to just do things that make no sense at all and everybody goes with it. Yeah, right. And that's um, a great example. I think. That's my kind of audience, I suppose. Yeah, and I think it's a lovely example of how you can actually rigorously structure something that contains madness you know mm. but actually it's having the structure and the constraint i suppose that allows yeah. these moments of exactly because if it was too if it was too mad we'd feel lost in it yeah yeah completely and we wouldn't know where we we wouldn't know what our anchor was hmm. so it's got so it's got to sort of obey its own rules to a certain point right. so that when they're broken we go oh that's lovely yeah right absolutely and um uh, and probably the last question um, so you've been writing plays for 15, 20 years, something like that, maybe more. Yeah, my, well, I mean, my first one was, was performed in 1996. 
Okay, 24 so, years. Man, which makes okay. me really quite old, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm asking everybody this very blunt question. What have you learnt? What can you, what can you say you know how to do now as a playwright that maybe in 1996 you wouldn't have known how to do? I think I've got better at knowing, uh, uh, better at being easily bored. So trying to be more easily bored than the audience, knowing when I'm being indulgent or knowing when something's taking a bit long or having a sense of how, how having a feeling the length of something. And, um, you know, my plays are getting shorter at the moment. For a while, they were getting longer. And posh is, I mean, posh takes about three days to perform. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but, um, uh, but so it, a sense... Of, of how long we want to sit with a story really and a sense of what 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 I want to do and what I want to spend time with because right. when you get when you I was gonna say when you get into bed with the play that's um when you when you decide that you are I suppose they are I mean, they are like relationships you're getting into a relationship that you know you're going to be in for some years mm. and have you got a strong enough love for that idea and a strong enough foundation for that play to um, to want to spend that time and to believe that that thing is going to come out as as excellent as you want it. So, uh, so a, a sort of selectiveness really about which baskets I'm going to put eggs in, and and I'm working hard not to get oversubscribed, which I did for for some for some time in, earlier in my career. I just sort of said yes to everything because of a fear that people wouldn't ask again. But then suddenly, you know, you've got three plays on the go and, uh, and a radio play and this and that and everything, everybody wants it by the end of the month. And for me, that's, I, that isn't enabling. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Great, that's very, uh, that's very- it's all, it's all work in progress because it's, it's um, I still fall down on all of those things occasionally. Right. Um, and it's it's I, I sometimes feel like a, a, a writing life is kind of like a very long experiment on a brain and it's your own brain and you're sort of just trying to work out where to poke it and what to pour on it and how much rest it needs between things in order for the for good stuff to come out. Yeah, that sounds like, you know, cooking. sounds like you're weirdly cooking your own brain. <laughs> and of course, during all that time. That, that brain is getting older as you go along. So hey, talk to it's me about falling it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look, that's a, a great place to end. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Laura. Uh, I hope to see you when all of this bloody war is over. Um, yeah, thank you very much. See you soon. Love to Sam. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you.